We're in the first half of the tribulation. Yes. Uh, a lot of people do not realize how many things happen during this first half of the tribulation. Last week, we looked at the five months of the fifth trumpet. When death flees, they're being tormented by these demon locusts and they cannot, they cannot die. God takes away the possibility to die during those five months. Uh, when the sixth trumpet sounds, four angels are released to kill one third of the remaining population mm -hmm. with three plagues. Let's begin with Revelation chapter nine, verse 13. Then the sixth angel sounded and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. The sixth trumpet begins the second woe. Some think that the voice that is heard from the four altars is the altar itself crying out uh, because of the martyrs uh, from under the altar. While others think that it is uh, the martyrs under the altar. So we have these two options that some people think. Some think it's the altar itself and some think it's the martyrs who were under the altar. The voice from the four horns of the golden altar speaks with authority. This is not the voice of an angel, but it is the voice of the Lamb of God. When Jesus received the scroll from the Father's right hand, he was declared worthy to carry out the Father's judgment. So it is my contention that what we're hearing is a sound from the presence of God, from the altar. I believe it's the Lamb of God speaking with this authority to carry out the judgments that are about to take place. Verse 14, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. These are four fallen angels that have authority over a second demonic host. Now, let me back up just a little bit to try to bring everyone uh, back to the same page. When the last trumpet sound, the fifth trumpet, there, there were a horde of demons, demon locusts that were re released from the bottomless pit. Uh, and they had power to torment men with their stings for five months. Uh, now, at this juncture, we have a second uh, amount of evil forces that are released. Uh, they, these four angels have specific authority over the region around the river Euphrates. Now, I don't know how much you know about evil forces and powers. Let me say just very shortly, I don't want to get into an in-depth study on demons or angels. Uh, but as with the angels of God, so is with the demonic are fallen angels, there are classes of them. The scripture talks about principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age. Uh, those are obviously different ranks or categories of evil angels, fallen angels, who have specific authority. I have noticed in my pastoral ministry that there are regions where there are certain evil uh, influences. We pastored in one area, and in that one area, there was a spiritual power that was working in that area. And it was specifically attacking the church and the leadership of the church. 
uh, that was the force of this evil power. It was noteworthy, uh, and once you saw this and recognized what was going on, every church, hear me, every church in that region had had at least one pastor, and most of them many pastors, and also many deacons and leaders of the church who had had moral failure. Can you imagine in this city, if every church, every church had a pastor or pastoral staff that had had moral failure, or church leadership that had had moral failure. It was a spiritual attack on that region. Uh, I know another region where there was a uh, host, a uh, large number of witches that were active in that region. Uh, there had been many mutilations of animals. There was active uh, uh, groups of, of these uh, witches that were active in that, that region. In fact, in that, in that uh, area, they had a retreat, like we have a youth camp. They had a retreat for witches and witches would come to there from all over the world. So the influence of that was definitely felt and noticed by a lot of people. When we were pastoring in that region, I dealt with, helped several people who were coming out of witchcraft and out of demonology. Uh, I've said that to say this. There are regions where spiritual forces have specific power. Here in Revelation 9 and 14, these four angels who are bound over, who had authority over the great river Euphrates, they are there, verse 15. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. Wow, 200 million. This is a testimony of God's sovereign power and control over the timing of his eternal plan. You need to know, let me tell you, church, God is the ultimate authority and power. Amen. Satan is not. God is. Did you know, if you don't, let me tell you, the church has the ability to hold back the forces of evil. You are a restraining force in this world. These four angels had been prepared for that hour, day, month, and year. When they are released, the scripture says they lead a, an army of 200 million, 200 million horsemen. Uh, some... Bible expositors believe that this is China that has the ability to send 200 million horsemen. The description shows them that they are not human but a second horde of demonic host. Now let me say something uh, and I don't want to be contradictory to my own uh, teaching but I, it's very important, I think, to say this. Many times when demons are active, human beings will also be in, in harmony with their action. I would not be surprised if a demonic force moves out when these are released and that there are human instrumentalities that are involved in this. But the description that we have in the text does not tell us that it is China or another nation that is released, but that it is a horde, a second horde of demonic hosts. Now, the previous <clears throat> demonic 
hosts, the, the locusts that were released, tormented humanity for five months. Three plagues that are to come as a result of these horsemen brings about the death of one third of the human population. Now, after what we have already seen, this is a gigantic hit that is coming upon the earth. Now let's look at a little bit of a description. Verse 17. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hastinth blue, silver yellow, and the heads of the horses like, were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed. By the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone, which came out of their mouths. Verse 19. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents, having heads, and with them they do harm. It is important for us to remember that 144,000 Jews who have the seal of God are exempted from this demonic army. I think it's very important for us to realize, and let me bring this back to the church age to where you are living right now. The blood of Jesus Christ is powerful against every force of evil that would come. That right. Verse number 20. But the rest of mankind, in other words, those that are not the 144,000, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. I want you to get this message, please hear the judgments that God sends, it seems like in the Old Testament and also in the book of Revelation here, doesn't it seem sometimes that they're just punitive? You know, they're just, just to bring judgment on the, on the wicked. But when you read these verses that I just read to you, God is, is giving these things or allowing these things for another opportunity for people to repent of their evil. That's right. That's right. I, I need to remind you again, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Every judgment throughout the history of man with Israel or with other nations has always been, God has always done this, Anytime judgment comes, God uses the judgment as an opportunity to get people to fall on their faces and turn to God and to repent. But what they do is what so many people do. Rather than repenting of the evil that they have done, their heart is hardened against God. And instead of repenting, they continue on in their murder, sorcery, sexual immorality, and thefts. You know, this is a true tragedy, I believe. This judgment that comes on the world as a result of this sixth trumpet does not produce repentance. Even with the destruction that is brought about by the demonic hordes, they did not stop worshiping demons. They did not stop worshiping, worshiping idols of gold and silver, stone and wood. They did not repent of their actions, their immoral actions. Their rebellion against God only led them to greater and greater evil. I want you to remember all the way back to the Tower of Babel, this same kind of thing was going on in the hearts of men. In fact, if you go back even a little bit farther, go back to Noah's day, his generation, 
when the thoughts of men were only evil continually. God brought the judgment, and you would, you would have thought, would you have not, that after the flood, that everybody that came out of Noah's generation, that they would have looked back at the flood and they would, would have used that as a good uh, point. That's what happens to people who rebel against God. Yeah. But within a short term, they have the Tower of Babel and they're rebelling against one, God one more time. Uh, have you ever tried to legislate righteousness? Do you know what I mean? If you don't straighten up, I'm going to spank you. Uh -huh. Well, it didn't work. <laughs> Something has to happen in the heart that changes the person. Yes. Now, between the sixth and the seventh trumpet, there is an interlude, and several things happen during this interlude. A mighty angel comes, a little book is given, seven thunders and two witnesses. Let's begin at chapter 10, verse 1. I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. Although no name is given to this mighty angel, some believe really many believe that this is either Gabriel or Michael. He's a mighty angel. His description does not assume at all that this is the Lord Jesus Christ, though I have read some who, who think this is a tribulation uh, appearance of Jesus Christ setting his foot on the earth. That's not what this is. His description depicts a mighty angel of God. This angel comes from the presence of God. He's, he's a strong angel, and he, he declares that the Lord is worthy. Hallelujah. Verse number two. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Now, the little book that he has is not the unsealed scroll. This is another little book. He stands on the sea and on the land, and this is a testimony of worldwide dominion and power. He's about to release, a, in a greater scope, uh, things that we have not even seen the like, like of yet. Now, let, let me try to explain. Let's go back. Uh, Take a look back at what we've seen in our study in Revelation thus far. Thus far, we have seen over, over half of the population killed during the tribulation. A third of the waters turned to, to blood are made undrinkable. Uh, the destructions that have come thus far the torments that have come this far. What is about to happen after this angel appears is going to be much worse than what we have seen thus far. Verse number three. And cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars, when he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now, when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders utter and do not write them. So John sees what is going to take place with these seven thunders. Uh, they are so utterly terrible that John is told, seal it up and don't write it down. It will be revealed in its time. You know, I, 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 
Part of me says, I would like to know what the seven thunders are. And part of me says, no, I know too much anyway. So the seven thunder judgments are so terrible that God withholds them until the time they will be revealed. Verse five, the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever, who created heaven and all and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it and the sea and the things that are in it that there should be delay no longer. In other words, we have heard before when the Lord told the martyrs just a little bit longer. Now we're reaching a point where the time is up. Uh, there will be no more delay. The things that are about to happen are going to come quickly. In fact, I've been working on the last half of the tribulation. And as I have been doing so, the events that are coming up happen so rapidly and with such great force and such world shaking events that uh, it, is, it is overwhelming, really, the things that are about to take place on the earth. Verse number seven. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. So when the seventh angel sounds his trumpet, these mis mysterious events are going to be finished. So there, there seems to be a little bit of a delay from the announcement of these things until they actually occur. They're waiting on the sounding of the seventh trumpet. There are secrets that God has hidden until this time. You know, some people think that, well, I can't learn anything new. Well, God has a lot of secrets and knowledge that we have no knowledge of. That's right. He is wiser than man, and he has things that he has not revealed. In fact, when the Lord Jesus was here and was ministering to his disciples, you remember this. He told them, there are things that I would like to tell you that you are not able to bear. But when the Holy Spirit comes, he will give you enlightenment or show you the truth, these truths when he comes. Now we are seeing another area of things that God knows, divine secrets, things that are hidden from man that are about to be revealed. One of these days, this world is going to know that God is who he is. This verse is an anticipation of the ultimate consummation of the end of Satan and of his rule. Now, don't be disturbed, dear one, at the signs and the times that we are in. There are certain things that must take place in order for Satan to be cast into the lake of fire. And Though they are cataclysmic and gigantic and fearsome events, it's awesome to know that we, the church, that all of us who have put our faith and trust in God are going to be protected and we will not be subjected to those things. The next section is a renewal of a commission that John has been given to be a prophet to all the people. Then a voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go, take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. Now this is not the scroll that had the seven seals. Once again, verse number nine. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I'd eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, 
You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. So what John has been doing already, the Lord is giving him a renewal to his, his commission as a prophet and as an apostle that he's going to be prophesying. Now the word prophesying is prophetia. Uh, it's declaring preaching, giving a, a divine message, but he's going to be prophesying again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. You know, it's a very sweet thing in some ways to read about the judgment of God over Satan and his kingdom. But there's a bitterness over the judgment that must come on the wicked and unbelieving world. It would be considered this. Every one of us would rejoice, would we not, if Satan was destroyed and his power was no more. Many of us have loved ones who are not right with God. There's nothing that is pleasing in my heart about the wicked being destroyed. Now, there was a prophet in the Old Testament. His name was Jonah. God told him, Jonah, I want you to go down to Nineveh and I want you to prophesy against that nation. And I want you to tell them that they need to repent or else I will destroy Nineveh in three days. And Jonah said, Lord, I don't want to go. He said, I know what kind of people they are. They're wicked people. They deserve everything that they're going to get. Lord, it would be better. It would be better if they would die rather than live. And so he went to Nineveh and he preached the preaching, the prophecy that God had given him. And when he did, the people in Nineveh did repent. See, God really wants, as I said earlier, in all of these judgments, God really wants people to repent. Amen. The hard fact is a third of the world's population is going to be destroyed again because they refuse to repent. That's right. So John is going to prophesy again to peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. No doubt this is an extension of his prophetic ministry to include all of the last half of the tribulation in those events. Mm -hmm. 